Good morning from Doc Miami. This is Dr. John Bennett, televising for Neurosurgical TV. Today we have the pleasure of starting an online conference of uh, pediatric neurosurgery uh, in collaboration with Deepak Gupta, MD, a neurosurgeon from the Ames Hospital in New Delhi, A double I M S. Um, he's assembled a tremendous cast of of neurosurgeons from from India, and also we're joined by a panelist. First of all, I'll introduce the panelists, and then we'll turn it over to Deepak. Good morning, Francesca. Uh, uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Francesca. I'm a fifth-year medical student from Bucharest, Romania, and I'm also uh, this year the president of the Walter Dendy Neurosurgical Club here. And yeah, well, uh, I am really excited to see what uh, Dr. Gupta has to say. <laughs> Welcome, welcome, welcome. Okay, Dr. Gupta, it's all good. Thank you very much. Hi, good morning. Uh, it's uh, 9 o'clock in the morning, uh, Indian Standard Time. Uh, for my European counterparts and my, my friends in US, it must be quite early in the morning or maybe late night. So anyway, greetings to you from uh, New Delhi, uh, India. It's a pleasant uh, morning outside. Uh, basically, this is a move uh, by our society and by myself uh, to promote pediatric neurosurgical services, uh, not only in India, but all over the world. Now, over the next two days, uh, there will be a series of uh, deliberations, debates, talks, lectures by uh, very eminent uh, neurosurgeons, uh, mainly from India. They will be talking about various issues related to uh, craniosynostosis, spinal dysphysms, encephalosis, pediatric brain tumors, and so on and hence forth. And uh, all the faculty are lined up. Uh, they will be giving a 45 minutes talk, followed by 15 minutes of discussion. Anybody who joins uh, this neurosurgical television on Google Hangout can uh, ask questions directly to the faculty. And I believe and I understand uh, John Bennett from Miami has done uh, very hard work on this to set up this program. And uh, this series of lectures will be available on YouTube and also on uh, ACNS website, Neurosurgical TV, uh, to be seen by the residents uh, later on. So this is a good move, and it is uh, one of the moves, I would say, uh, to promote uh, uh, the non-existent uh, pediatric neurosurgical services advancements in distant, far-off uh, areas of the world. So probably we could begin uh, with my uh, initial talk, John, if you permit, uh, on development of pediatric neurosurgical services in India. Very good. Okay, perfect. All right. So uh, I'm presently working as addition professor neurosurgery at uh, Neurosciences Center and uh, Apex Trauma Center of uh, New Delhi. I'm working in All India Institute of Medical Sciences. What is pediatric neurosurgery? Well, it is basically uh, any beneficially intended intracranial intervention in a living child. That's the crux of pediatric neurosurgery, I would say. Now, pediatric neurosurgery. <coughs> Excuse me. It exists as a member of the family of neurosurgery. If you go back to the ancient era or the history of uh, neurosurgery, I would say the first operation of epilepsy in a child was done way back in 1886 by Victor Horsley. So I would say that was the beginning of a uh, modern era of neurosurgery way back in the uh, 19th century. Uh, we all know that Harvey Cushing's and Walter Dendy, uh, they did operate on tumors of children and extensive work is already published in the literature. Now, <clears throat> whether to have uh, dedicated pediatric neurosurgical institutions for India or for the world, whether it's a reality or a virtuality, that remains to be questioned. Uh, there are two schools of thoughts. Some people think that you need to have those centers wherein only pediatric services are available. However, there's another school of thought we say that it is not actually practical. This is going to be very expensive and uh, out of reach of the common masses to have dedicated pediatric neurosurgical centers in uh, all parts of the world, I would say. But yes, uh, in certain major metropolis, uh, it is the need and people are talking about pediatric institutions with multidisciplinary facilities and personal to deal with complex pediatric problems because it is difficult for a patient to move from one country to another country uh, just to get the advanced uh, neurosurgical care uh, for these children. Let's say, for example, craniofacial abnormalities, skull-based surgeries, complex, li complex lipomas, and, and so on and henceforth. And, uh, of course, uh, any institute 
if it is desired, they should also have a neonatologist, pediatric intensivist, because they are a big asset to the uh, pediatric neurosurgical centers. The most important thing is that a concept of teamwork. The teamwork approach of different specialties is actually required in case you want to have a pediatric neurosurgical setup. I would have a disclaimer to begin with. Should pediatric neurosurgery be practiced only by surgeons who have spent two years as fellows in certain self-appointed centers and who forswear all adult practice? Well, my answer is no. I do not believe in this philosophy that a general surgeon or a neurosurgeon who is practicing neurosurgery for many, many years should actually give up adult neurosurgical practice and uh, start doing only isolated pediatric neurosurgery. What is the current picture, I would say? The real picture of pediatric neurosurgery, not only in India, but probably in other parts of the world, I will leave it to the panelists to uh, comment on that after, at the end of my talk. Most of the places, congenital hydrocephalus, spinal dysphagism is actually being done by the pediatric surgeons in private setups. The neuroendoscopies for the hydrocephalus is being done by pediatric surgeons in private setups. I'm talking about endoscopic third ventriculostomy is being done. The craniofacial disorder surgeries or for the craniosynostosis is being done by plastic surgeons and by the pediatric surgeons in some centers. The craniocervical disorders, craniovertebral junctions problems, pediatric spinal tumors, congenital spinal deformities, they are being done by spine surgeons. We talk about pediatric brain tumors, they are being done by all. We talk about head injuries, they are being done by neurotraumatologists and by the general surgeons, yes, in some centers. Birth plexus injuries, brachial plexus injuries, they are being done by plastic surgeons. We talk about Moya Moya epilepsy, it is basically a part of the respective specialties in these fields. And we talk about the fetal surgeries in the pediatric neurosurgery, it is practically non existent in our country. In some sections of the world, especially US, Brazil, uh, yes, it is being done, especially after the mom's trial. So that is the true picture of pediatric neurosurgery, I would say. Why it is not a sought after specialty? Well, I would say probably people think it is too easy to treat. It is meant only for the bigness. There is no rush of catecholamines or adrenaline with operating on kids, unlike in cerebrovascular or skull-based surgeries in the adults. Or maybe it's, uh, people find it difficult to communicate with the kids. Or maybe it has got least return. I mean, these are some of the factors I think are kind of uh, responsible for this being not a very sought after specialty. Why no one actually took interest in adopting this subspecialty at my hospital in India, in New Delhi and in major centers I would say is that probably there is a nihilism to take it up as a branch because mostly people think it is nothing but operating on leaking meningomyelocele, shunt malfunctions, encephalosis and occasional craniosynostosis which actually is not true. The field is quite vast. You have chances and you can learn and do fellowships in doing pediatric epilepsy surgery, pediatric neuro-oncology, craniofacial work, congenital deformities of the spine, craniovertebral junctions, moya moema, cerebrovascular. The field is unending, I would say. Well, uh, the pediatric neurosurgery in India, if you read about the ancient uh, Hindu mythology and Charak and Shishut uh, literature, uh, the first uh, head transplantation in a, in a human being uh, was uh, carried out in uh, Daksha or Prajapati. He was the father of uh, Parvati or the, or the wife of Lord Shiva, and his head was decapitated by uh, by his uh, by his soldiers. And subsequently, uh, it was the the sheep head was transplanted on him. That is way back way back in Indian mythology. And uh, probably uh, some years later, the same thing happened to our uh, so-called uh, Lord Ganesha. His head was again decapitated by his father. Uh, the Lord Shiva in anger and subsequently when uh, Parvati asked his head to be uh, returned, the head of an elephant was transplanted on uh, Lord Ganesha and he is popularly known as Lord Ganesha in Hindu mythology. So probably in Hindu mythology itself, people are talking about adult neurosurgery and pediatric neurosurgery uh, a long, long time years back. Now. There are some special situations wherein you do need pediatric neurosurgeons. It is because a pediatric neurosurgeon is kind of up to date with what is happening in the field. Let's say for example, you have a patient with optical chiasmatic hypothermic glioma with or without neurofibromatosis type 1. 
the operative dilemma remains whether to operate these patients or whether to give chemotherapy. Now, a surgeon or a person who is dealing with these cases on a regular basis, he will be the right person to manage such cases of opticochasmatic hypothalamic gland because there are some cases wherein surgery is actually not required. You can very well get away by doing this, subjecting these patients to chemotherapy. This is a patient who came to me and was referred to me for surgery and subsequently when I had a look at the scans and found that this patient had some uh, neurofibromatosis, I subjected this patient to chemotherapy and the patient actually improved. This is another interesting child who was sent to me for surgery. If you look at the patient, child, child patient has got bilateral proptosis, his age was 8 months and he had intensely enhancing bilateral cavernous sinus lesion. These are the bilateral cavernous hemangiomas. And the patient was sent to me for surgery at this region. Why on this earth I would operate? No. I would definitely give a chance to these patients of medical therapy. And not many people were aware, are actually aware that these cases can be very well tidied over and managed by propranol therapy. So I started this patient on propranol therapy and this child improved and the surgery was obviated. So all these newer happenings in the field are uh, kind of more so uh, known to those who are practicing pediatric neurosurgery on a regular basis. And there's a whole crux of uh, having it as a subspecialty, I would say. If you talk about my country, India, well, uh, we all know that India is huge. <clears throat> we have a population of 1.28 billion. There are few centers in this country which are catering to pediatric neurosurgical services. However, they are not many. We have approximately 2,500 uh, neurosurgeons in this country. However, if you talk about the pediatric neurosurgeons, they are less than 250 uh, in our country. And uh, this situation is actually the same all over the world, I would say. As per the WFNS statistics, uh, the entire world has got approximately 30,000 neurosurgeons, out of which three major countries, US, Japan, and uh, Brazil, uh, they have got only half of the neurosurgeons in the world. However, if you talk about the pediatric neurosurgeons, the, the population of the pediatric neurosurgeons all over the world remains a handful. Now, other thing which is very interesting is that India is a young country. One third of the world population of the young adults live in India. 40% of the Indian population is child, children. And less than 40% of the Indian population is less than 6 years of age. We do have a declining incidence of the neural, neural tube defects or the spinal disorders uh, in our country. However, the tumors, the tether core syndromes and other things are on increase. So what I try, I'm trying to say that there's a, there's a huge, huge voluminous population of these children with neurosurgical ailments which require to be treated uh, by uh, qualified uh, neurosurgeons having good amount of experience in catering to this population. We began, I would say, almost two decades after the rest of the world. Pediatric neurosurgery came into real existence in 1950s in the world. However, in India, it started picking up in 1970s. The dedicated efforts of pediatric neurosurgery started beginning in 1980s, and it was established as a specialty in 1990s. We currently have got more than 250 members of Indian Society of Pediatric Neurosurgery. We do have a, uh, a journal of uh, pediatric neuroscience uh, uh, in, from our country. However, if you talk about the global front versus at my hospital or in my country, we have got, in the present generation, we have got big names like Professor Dhiropo, Declan Pang, Paul Stinbok, and so many other neurosurgeons. However, if you talk about the dedicated pediatric neurosurgeons back home in my hospital or in my country, they are handfuls. But I just want to reiterate that is there really a need to have a dedicated pediatric neurosurgeons? Because that remains to be questioned and uh, a hot topic of debate. The modern era of neurosurgery in my country actually began after India got independence way back in 1947. Uh, in fact, the, the two uh, neurosurgeons, the, the Jacob Chandy and Ramamurthy Bal Balasubramaniam, were the pioneers, uh, the pillars of neurosurgery in our country. And subsequently, it was Professor S. N. Bhagwati who was instrumental in starting pediatric neurosurgical services in our country. We do have a membership of more than 2,500 uh, plus uh, neurosurgeons uh, in the Neurological Society of India, which began in 1951. And we do have a membership of more than 250 members 
in Indian Society of Pediatric Neurosurgery, which began way back in 1990s. These are the presidents of past presidents of Indian Society of Pediatric Neurosurgery of our country, the last being Professor uh, E. Chitambram. And these are the currently active uh, pediatric neurosurgeons, I would say, uh, who are kind of leading the, the modern era of uh, pediatric neurosurgery. This is Professor A.K. Banerjee, uh, Professor A.K. Mahapatra, Professor B.K. Jain, Professor Dev Pujari. In fact, the first National Pediatric Neurosurgical Symposium was organized way back in 1985 by Professor Raja Reddy from Hyderabad. And subsequently, our second National Pediatric Neurosurgical Symposium was organized in 1988 by Professor S.N. Bhagwati. We were uh, fortunate enough to hold uh, the 17th International Society for Pediatric Neurosurgery meeting in 1989 and sub subsequently our society was laid down in 1990s. These are the group of uh, pediatric neurosurgeons uh, from India. So uh, the, 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 the heated topic of debate, whether we really need to have an exclusive group of pediatric neurosurgeons, well, uh, John Chiloda beautifully mentioned in his uh, article in Child Nervous System 1997, no. And I think I fully agree to that. Uh, the reason being very, very simple and clear, uh, you know, you need to manage your patients when they grow up to the adulthood. Like, for example, you have operated on a patient with a ventricular peritoneal shunt at the age of 2 years, 3 years, 4 years. And when the child grows to 20 years of age and develops on shunt malfunction, who will treat? You want an uh, adult neurosurgeon who has not seen any, any such cases to treat? or surgeon who is having enough experience or your follow-up case, you will be treating those cases. And naturally, if given a choice between a competent neurosurgeon who is not trained in fellowship systems and a fellow who is having just limited one to two years experience of pediatric neurosurgery, who will you offer yourself to? Naturally, you would like to uh, get operated by some, somebody who is having a vast amount of experience of 10, 15, 20, 30 years in neurosurgery as compared to somebody who has done one year fellowship in pediatric neurosurgery to be to operate on a child or on uh, somebody close to you. So the common apprehension which neurosurgeons think why they do not take up pediatric neurosurgery is that they always feel that soon they would lose touch with the advances in neurosurgery. They feel that they will have very few meetings to attend to their schedule, which probably is correct. I do agree to it. These are the number of cases of pediatric neurosurgery operated in various centers in different parts of the world. The, uh, the, the major academic centers are doing the major amount of chunk uh, at institute in 2009. We operated almost 650 <coughs> plus pediatric cases. And now, in fact, uh, we operate more than 1,000 uh, uh, pediatric uh, neurosurgical cases every year in our hospital. In fact, there are some dedicated pediatric neurosurgical centers. One being which I know about is in Chennai, the Children Trust Hospital and another, another being the Wadia Hospital in Mumbai. <clears throat> Rest all places, uh, the cases are being operated uh, by uh, adult neurosurgeons with special interest in pediatric neurosurgery. These are the common problems of the children which we commonly see in our practice. <clears throat> These are the different types of tumors, uh, the incidence being almost approximately the same in different parts of the India. Uh, we do have a uh, major contribution to the development of shunt systems uh, or the ventricular peritoneal shunt systems. In fact, uh, some of our shunts, Upadhyaya shunt, Chabla shunts are being used all over the world. Uh, the Chabla shunt being developed by one of the pioneer neurosurgeons of our country is being used in major, major parts of the world <clears throat> because it is very, very cost effective and it works very well. <clears throat> Excuse me. We were a part of International Infantile Hydrocephalus Studies <clears throat> and we have contributed significant literature to the management guidelines of uh, pediatric post tubercular hydrocephalus because this is one condition which is very, very commonly seen in our country still, though the incidence has come down drastically. Now the problem is <clears throat> because of the limited number of surgeons doing this uh, activity in our country, we have a huge volume and we have a long waiting list. And that is why majority of the children are not able to get the treatment at the appropriate places in appropriate surgical hands. Now what is the current pediatric neurosurgical services practice at institutes? What we have? Well, these are the kind of surgeries which we have been doing since 1972. <coughs> Excuse me. We have been doing craniofacial surgery since 1972. Uh, we have been doing neural tube defects, spinal disabism, shunt surgeries, 
and pediatric cardiology, ICP monitoring, neuro-oncology, epilepsy surgeries, and recently we've started doing, in fact, last one decade, we've started doing our uh, deep brain stimulation. And now, over the last uh, couple of years, what I have started is that I've started developing a 3D print model based uh, training for the residents. Uh, we, are we are starting fellowships in pediatric neurosurgical one-year course at my hospital. In fact, there are some centers in our country under the aegis of Indian Society of Pediatric Neurosurgery which are already offering fellowships in pediatric neurosurgery to the fellows. And uh, this present course of uh, two days duration uh, the, is the first of its kind uh, online pediatric neurosurgical course available to the rest of the world. And of course, uh, we are also doing uh, some pediatric neurosurgical updates, uh, which I think is uh, something uh, the need of the hour uh, for people to learn what is new happening in the world of pediatric neurosurgery sitting at their desktop. So we do have regular ISP traveling fellowship to the AMC students since 1994. And Professor A.K. Mahapatra, one of my, my teacher, uh, he has contributed significantly to pediatric neurosurgery at my hospital and also in India. We have an extensive work on molecular subtyping of pediatric medulloblastomas published. We have uh, organized various international and national uh, pediatric neurosurgical meetings at different uh, time frames. And uh, we have state-of-the-art uh, cadaveric training labs and we have got uh, a soft tissue lab for teaching of the residents to learn the various uh, techniques of how to do craniofacial and craniosinusclerosis surgeries in these children. So we are offering state-of-the-art management to these patients of cerebrovascular disorders and patients with all kinds of complex uh, cranial and uh, trauma. In fact, recently we are a part of uh, Approaches and Decisions in Pediatric TBI, which is the largest consortium of uh, uh, neurotrauma uh, registry for the children in the world ever to happen. And uh, this consortium is going to be a game changer in laying down guidelines for the management of uh, severe pediatric uh, traumatic brain injury patients. These are the kind of children which we see in a single outpatient clinic. Six patients of uh, spinal disabilities of different uh, types coming to you in a single OPD. And uh, these are the 3D print model. In fact, uh, I took this technique from uh, one of my uh, another fe uh, fellow institute in uh, south of India, Cochin, where I learned this technique and I started training it uh, to our uh, residents and young faculty how to do uh, cranial sinusosis surgeries on a mathematical model uh, uh, for these children. In fact, one of my colleagues will be talking about it tomorrow, uh, who started this technique in southern part of India. Uh, we are doing extensive work on split cord malformations, myelocystosis. In fact, ours is the largest series in the world uh, because we do see lots and lots of these children uh, uh, with these uh, congenital malformations. And uh, we have over 1,000 cases of uh, craniopharyngiomas published in the literature over the last uh, five decades, and we have done some molecular subtyping and study of brain invasion in craniopharyngiomas. And uh, these are again the kind of comparison of India with the rest of the world on the different kinds of tumors uh, being detected and managed in the children. So we have done large amount of uh, extensive work on the molecular subgrouping in uh, uh, medulloblastomas. We have been able to identify based on immunohistochemistry the different subsections of uh, uh, medulloblastomas based on the WMT, sonic hedgehog, and the non wind pathways. And we have been able to prognosticate uh, these children. These are the fish now. Uh, uh, pictures uh, showing uh, the substratification of this uh, non uh, pathway uh, group medulloblastomas. In fact, one of our faculty from Bangalore uh, will be talking about uh, the <clears throat> these issues on neuro-oncology uh, tomorrow in one of our lecture. So we are managing all kinds of epidemic linear vertebral junction and spinal abnormalities uh, in these children and uh, Recently, uh, over the last uh, two years, we have started a center of excellence for pediatric epilepsy surgeries. In fact, now we have done over 850 uh, such pediatric epilepsy surgeries, uh, and we do have facilities like uh, MAC, uh, SPEC, PET, video EEG, EEG, and intraoperative brain suits and robotic device assistance uh, uh, for the management of these children. This is a center of excellence uh, being uh, there at All Industry Medical Sciences. So we are doing over 1,000 pediatric neurosurgical cases uh, on, almost on annual basis and the incidence is increasing with the increased number of theaters and more number of younger faculty from my department taking up keen interest in pediatric neurosurgical services. So I think uh, apart from what the clinical work we are doing, there is a, there is a need for uh, 
awareness about various uh, pediatric conditions among the pediatricians, neonatologists, and to make them refer these patients to the right person at the right time. And uh, we do have a large population, and though, so we need large number of neurosurgeons in our country uh, to manage these case, patients. And of course, we are now talking about the national programs uh, to educate children, uh, to educate uh, people about the preconception use of folates and the need for spacing of pregnancies, family plannings, and ultrasonography at frequent intervals. And of course, we have started the various spina bifida clinics all over India. So these are the few modules uh, uh, I have developed back home in my hospital uh, for the fellowship trainings on congenital hypercapulous neural endoscopies, uh, cleaning of cervical junction disorders, pediatric brain tumors, pediatric head and spinal injuries, and epilepsy and petal surgeries. Uh, our society has taken various initiatives in this direction. In fact, the Neurosurgical Society of India has already taken a move and uh, we did the first pediatric neurosurgery CME course uh, in July this year in South, South part of India. Uh, the Indian Society of Pediatric Neurosurgery has taken various initiatives of starting fellowships, of resident, offering resident fellowships and doing some various sessions for the residents exclusively in their annual meetings apart from conducting regular ISP and CME meets as a part of the annual meetings. We do have uh, certain uh, parts of the country wherein we are offering telemedicine facility to give advice to the remote areas and uh, the issue of remoting in remote areas is uh, almost practically non-existent, I would say, uh, in our country. So, but we do have a big amount of supply and availability gap. And this gap, I would say, is decreasing with more and more number of people taking active interest. So, and uh, this supply availability gap, I would say, is actually persisting uh, all over the world. Health industry in India is actually booming. Economy is showing an upward surge. We do have new private centers, such as the MRI, PET, endoscopes, MEG, and so many. You name a facility in the world, it is available in the country. And uh, I would say that globalization, liberalization of economy, and promotion of health insurance are the key major uh, new things happening in our country. The goals of a pediatric neurosurgeon, I would say, is to improve awareness amongst general population. We sh he should be giving regular lectures on specific topics for pediatricians, general practitioners, healthcare workers and conduct various educational programs. And this lecture should be actually repeated, you know, to have uh, kind of re-emphasize re and reinforce the, the knowledge and of course uh, on, on, in the general public, say by a series of public events, lectures should also be conducted by, by us. Uh, a section remains divided. There, there, there is a school of thought. People say that you should have a separate uh, board certification examination for pediatric neurosurgeons, start some super specialty courses. I somehow differ. I feel that uh, somebody should be inclined to do pediatric neurosurgery uh, and a diploma or a fellowship for one or one to two years after neurosurgical practice is something which is uh, required to become uh, to be able to cater to pediatric neurosurgical populations. So uh, I would say uh, individualization of the pediatric neurosurgery promotes rapid and tremendous progress, and uh, awful lot to be done still. It is still it is far safe for a child to be treated by a neurosurgeon who has been trained in pediatric neurosurgery. However, there is a red flag to it, you know, like uh, getting operated by an experienced neurosurgeon by versus somebody who has got just very limited experience. So I think, uh, you know, like what people say, you need to be a surgeon first, you need to be a neurosurgeon second, and then a pediatric neurosurgeon. I also believe that pediatric neurosurgeons are mutants, like me. Their multiplication throughout the world in India demonstrates that a mutation was good because the number of the people in this world are increasing. A word of caution, I personally believe that pediatric neurosurgery fellowship should be run at centers where there is a broad range of problems, the bread and butter of pediatric neuro neurological problems, I would say, and not just the complex unusual cases. I'll be very happy to send my fellows at a center wherein all gamuts of pediatric neurosurgical operations like spinal dysphysm, craniosynostosis, nasal and cuff flow seals, all kind of epidetic brain tumors, epilepsies are being done in one center rather than sending my fellow for training exclusively for craniosynostosis surgery training for two years, three years altogether because I want to have a fellow who knows completely about all the wide gamut of problems in pediatric neurosurgery rather than you know getting himself restricted to a one specific uh, super super subspecialty which is not going to be very very useful I would say. 
I would say that computer neurosurgeons not trained in fellowship in periodic neurosurgery is much better than a fellow with one to two years of additional training. And the most important thing for the young people uh, who are watching me uh, is that you should always, always talk about the history taking because whatever the mother says or the patient attendant says is still just as important what scans shows. So history taking is again very, very important I would say. All neurosurgical training should have a period of basic training in periodic neurosurgical fellowship as part of their formal programs. That's my take on that. And children with neurosurgical problems are properly treated by those who are familiar and trained in work with the children. So spinal disabism surgery, hydrocephalus surgery uh, by general surgeons or periodic surgeon, I would say no. Doing head injuries or decompressing anectomy by general surgeons, especially in children, I don't think it should be really uh, promoted except in very strenuous circumstances and in those cases also those surgeons should be well trained to do those procedures. However, this remains something which is even debatable now. So there is a need for well trained pediatric neurosurgeons in India and across the world. There is a need for resident training in India and across the world and uh, the various incentives which we can offer is that to start and to promote and to take it further, the, the training fellowships to the residents and to the young young people, giving award as a token of appreciation to the postgraduates and the trainees, and of course they have a better coordination between pediatric neurosurgeons, pediatricians, and neurologists and intensivists. And of course we need to talk more about the educational fronts. Take up the new models of uh, uh, so-called 3D printing, STL models for the training of the of the people uh, to work on craniofacial surgeries. We need to create or kindle interest of pediatric neurosurgery amongst young neurosurgeons and of course bridge this urban rural gap. The various risk factors for the neural tube defects are known and we need to increase awareness for the sense. And I would say uh, the, the yes we do not have too much of thing happening in the international uh, front in pediatric neurosurgery but these are the contributions from our society, our country to the field of pediatric neurosurgery. Apart from ancient Hindu mythology, which I just talked about in the beginning, we do have uh, contributed Chabra Shans, Upadhyay Shans, and uh, we are the pioneers of starting spasticity surgery for these children. And of course, we do not have uh, major patents uh, as yet. However, I would say that uh, one should be talk targeting more in creating interest in pediatric neurosurgery rather than creating more pediatric neurosurgical centers or exclusive pediatric neurosurgical centers. And I would say that initiative to start online pediatric neurosurgery course is one such innovative idea from India. Uh, you need to have some mentors. I did have mentor like Professor Tiroko uh, when I did my fellowships. And uh, I do have my mentor and Professor Declan Pan and Professor Eke Mahapatra who have been constant source of guidance and uh, uh, they have helped me out whenever I was in any kind of need for any patient management. We are able to uh, do lots of uh, complex spinal surgeries. And uh, whenever I am in any trouble, I just shoot an email. Nowadays, with the internet being available to all the people, all parts of the world, I just write an email to my, my mentors, and uh, overnight I get a reply, and I'm able to take my decisions in some of my challenging cases. So one should not be shy in asking questions or uh, queries or you know in management of difficult cases. Uh, people in Australia have done this beautiful study, which was published in uh, 2015 in GNS. People talked about. Uh, doing a mobile pediatric neurosurgery or rapid response uh, neurosurgery for remote areas uh, wherein a uh, group of surgeons they actually instead of taking a patient from the source of injury to a specialized center where a lot of time gets wasted uh, through the facility of telemedicine where the CT scans are provided to the surgeons the surgeons actually went uh, with, this, with a series of his uh, armamentorium to the cent to the place uh, where the actual incident of uh, traumatic brain injury or a hematoma or life threatening pediatric neurosurgical problem occurred However, this is not really practical in most of the part of the world. I would say one needs to train more and more of pediatric neurosurgeon and teach them more rather than uh, <clears throat> doing this. So it is a teamwork which is the most important if you talk about the institutions. So I would say uh, the beautiful tree of pediatric neurosurgery was uh, planted in this country by Professor S. N. Bhagwati in way back in 1990s. And now this tree has actually bloomed and grown up significantly to a strength of more than 250 members of our society. And now I think the time has come for our country wherein and in fact for the rest of the world I would say wherein we need to say to the world yes pediatric neurosurgery is a subspecialty of neurosurgery which exists 
which is growing and it is not looking back. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Deepak, for an excellent presentation and overview of uh, pediatric neurosurgery in India and overall. Um, we, uh, I'd like to ask Francesca if she has any questions or comments for Dr. Gupta. Uh, th thank you so much, Dr. Gupta, for this incredible presentation. I think what's being done in India is more than impressive. And I agree that uh, there is a constant need of uh, pediatric neurosurgeons all over the world. And uh, actually, my life goal is to become one. <laughs> and everything I do is um, aiming to take me to that moment. But uh, uh, until then, congratulations to you. I have no, uh, no questions yet. Um, and I'm looking forward for to the other presentations. Thank you. Yeah, yeah we're very yeah, lucky, Dr. Gupta. You brought a few pediatric neurosurgeons to this conference to give lectures. Uh, so I'd like to thank you for that. Now, is it a one-year fellowship in India to be a pediatric neurosurgeon? Yes, uh, we are doing it after neurosurgical training. Uh, as I mentioned in my talk, one needs to be a surgeon first, a neurosurgeon second, and then a pediatric neurosurgeon. Uh, American uh, Board of Surgeons, there was uh, a debate of uh, having produced, you know, people uh, suggesting uh, that one should take up pediatric neurosurgery right from the beginning. However, this is not something which is accepted by all over the world. And now people are talking about fellowships after doing neurosurgical residency. So we are offering fellowships for one year uh, to the fellows who are qualified and certified neurosurgeons. And uh, there are four or five centers which are already offering fellowships. At my hospital, we'll be starting it uh, sometime next year. Now you mentioned a, a pediatric neurosurgery online courses. Uh, is that true? You have them now? Yes, the, the, this is the first course I'm doing today. And uh, for next two days, uh, the beauty of this course, which I feel, is that the experts can give a talk for 40 to 45 minutes. They can speak a lot. No, most of the conferences, when we give talks, the talk duration is 5 minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. And you cannot really talk in detail about one topic of interest. Right. And when they, you have a surgeon or a pediatric neurosurgeon, giving a talk for 45 minutes non-stop, I'm sure he can cover a lot. And a resident or a fellow, he need not travel to different part of the world, pay hefty uh, registration fee, air travel charges to listen to such lectures. He can see that lecture at his desktop, not once, again and again and again. So I would say this is a beautiful and innovative concept. And I hope uh, this comes to the usefulness of many, many people all over the world, especially those who are not able to travel to attend uh, those uh, conferences. Yeah, I, I think you recognize this platform right away, uh, the potential for what you're, what you're talking about. And, and uh, I, I would highly encourage you to use this platform with us or without us uh, in, in areas like pediatric neurosurgeons. You mentioned during a lecture talking, lecturing pedi pediatricians. I guess uh, with various topics. This would be an excellent platform for them to do so. Uh, since there's so few in uh, countries like like India and, and Brazil, etc. I highly encourage this platform and uh, hopefully we can work together doing that uh, in the future. So okay, uh, thank you very much for your excellent presentation Dr. Gupta and thank you for assembling a top flight uh, cast of uh, lecturers for this conference, and uh, we look forward to seeing the rest. So thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, we're just going to keep rolling, but we're, uh, we're going to edit this, edit, edit this part out. Uh, but uh, very good. So let me let me make sure. Let me the next lecturer, and you're welcome to stay, Dr. Gupta. Okay, I will stay, I will stay back for the rest of the two days and I'll oh, okay. touch. Okay, great. Okay, let me make sure let me get the shoe bot uh from my camera. Next talk is by uh, Dr. Depujan. Uh, Dr. Ra Rahu. Subot Rahu. Dr. Subot Raju. Yeah. yeah Dr. Surgical Subot. options and craniosynostosis. Yeah. So he'll be on my Hold on, let me check my email, make sure you got the link.
because we're using the same link. <clears throat> So how many neurosurgeons are there in Romania? Uh, may I ask uh, Fajiska as of now? Uh, yes, uh, there is a department in uh, the Bagdarzar Arseni Emergency Hospital in Bucharest. I'm not sure, I think we at least five. And there are some uh, uh, general neurosurgeons that uh, operated on uh, children too, but uh, uh, only this, this department is specialized. Okay, so the situation is same. Uh, yes, <laughs> we are working to do, I don't know, to become better. I, I'm just a student and right now I'm on an uh, adult department, I'm studying there. But uh, hopefully when I finish my residency, maybe I could come to India to <laughs> do a fellowship. Walter Dandy, uh, the, the, the associate society. Society. So you uh, hold a very different role in taking the field further. And uh, uh, I would say uh, foundation is laid down, laid down in the, in the student field. You know, like if you are able to produce the more interest at your level, your level, you could probably take it for the rest of the world. Yes, thank you. Uh, actually, in Romania, there are two chapters uh, of the Walter Dandy Society. There is one for neurosurgeons and um, residents, and uh, there is the other one uh, that we uh, founded, I don't know how to say, uh, two years ago, which is for medical students. And yes, uh, this, I this year we have the first graduates that will, uh, will become residents. Yes. I know. I know that. Yeah. Uh, uh, Francesca, are there many students uh, in your organization that have expressed an interest in pediatric neurosurgery? Um, no, unfortunately, not really. Um, okay. Most yeah. of them want to do skull-based surgery, of course. Okay. And yeah, it's general neurosurgery. Uh, but okay. but uh, I know three without me. Okay. So, and maybe those who are coming this year may, will be more interested. I don't know. I, I'm trying. Okay. okay. Well, you, well, you know, well, you Dr. Know, Dr. We are live in the live hospital now. now. Apparently, uh, they're really able to the televise way. it. Uh, televise it. And we're, and we're, we're speaking now into the hospital. So uh, I don't know if you want to continue televising or start another hangout. Uh, how do you feel about that? Even, even though uh, we're gonna, we're going to edit this because edit your talk. Uh, right now we're in, kind of in between talks, um, but it is being televised live. If you don't mind. Yes, sure. Please go ahead. Okay. Yeah, we, we were able to talk to the IT department, um, and and they easily easily hooked it up. Uh, yeah, and hopefully in the future we'll, we'll be able to do that, and you'll be able to do that in your system. Um, it, it sounds complicated, but really isn't with this platform, uh, and most IT techs know how to hook it up. Now, if any IT techs are listening out there, essentially uh, this platform uh, allows easy live streaming from, from, any, from any auditorium, from any uh, venue. And we've actually televised a few conferences in, in, from Spain, You're just using a, a, an iPad and a iPhone, <laughs> without actually using the uh, resources of the IT department. I know. Yeah, as long as it's in a strong P4 area, uh, yeah. which I'm sure New Delhi is, uh, there are par parts of it that are probably most of it's probably T4. Uh, because an iPhone can be a very powerful modem, for uh, and you can have, you know, you can televise webinars as long as it's in a G4 area, without having an elaborate hookup of hardware uh, or wires or whatever. Yeah. But uh, uh, so, what do you foresee the pe pe uh, uh, in teaching the pediatric uh, uh, neuro PNS courses online? 
Uh, you want to do basically hangouts? Or what do you foresee? What are you thinking now about that? Well, uh, as compared to the last course which I did uh, with you, I think uh, this is looking like much better. The, maybe I am in a I think correct surrounding. I was in a hotel uh, last time. But uh, I think uh, if a faculty is able to give the lectures uh, clearly, the voice reception and the slide quality is good. I think Google Hangout is a very easy, cost-effective means, and uh, it should be on. Uh, as I said uh, in my lecture also, the most important thing, if you want to produce more trained, certified pediatric neurosurgeon, is that they need to be constantly updated with what is right. new happening. Right. And this particular update can actually happen only by such online courses. The reason is very simple and clear. When we go and attend some conference, believe me, nobody attends the lectures and the conferences fully. They just listen for five minutes, seven minutes, eight minutes, one talk, and they just disappear. Right. Except for some uh, uh, good courses uh, wherein the courses are held in some resorts where you know, don't have any option to go out anywhere. If you compare that with the online course, because you can see it again and again uh, on, your, on your desktop, you don't miss out anything. You have a complete talk and a lecture with you at your desktop, and you can interact with the faculty, ask any questions. And the best thing is you are constantly updated. Yes. You don't have to read your books or whatever. The faculty is there at your doorstep to give you the talk to interact with you. What else you can ask for? Unfortunately, when we were residents, we did not have access to all these things. But now, over the last uh, uh, a decade and so, things have changed. And uh, the technology is uh, kind of going to be uh, very, very useful uh, for such promotional events and for uh, updates. It's good, yeah. I think. Yeah, I think you recognize that right away in Venice when we did that uh, conference on neurotrauma. I think you kind of saw that. Uh, yes. And, and I, I, I feel the same way. Um, and and one, one thing I think that we'll be working on, Deepak, is uh, educating the, the public and, and th this kind of platform can be interactive. Or in other words, now we have a tweet board right now, which I'm going to show you, um, which most people don't really use because they don't realize that, right, for example, right now they, they could be tweeting a comment or question um, because people are so used to just watching a video without interacting. But one, and I'm going to bring you right now, let me screen share the uh, place where we have the tweet board where people actually that are listening to us now can, uh, can actually comment. Uh, and uh, only they, everyone has a tweet board, everyone has a Twitter, Twitter account. And they can either, you see this tweet board, uh, Deepak? Yes, I see. Yeah. I see the... yeah, this this board, you know, is there, and people, you know, if, if people are watching, they're certainly welcome to tweet a question or a comment in, 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 in times like this, because we are live. I mean, and you, if you tweet a question right now or a comment, it's live. Uh, but the thing is, Deepak, people don't know about this. They think that... Well, we're going to watch this Google Hangout. They can't really uh, interact, but I think eventually people will see that it's an interactive medium. And, and I don't know if you noticed, Steve Patrick, but we're trying to aim, improve the interface of the Hangout. We have a Google Chat uh, option here where people can actually uh, they can they can submit a question or comment in a chat, and they actually can open the chat. I'm going to open it right now here. They, they have to go through the Gmail account, of course. And, but this chat box here, can you see the chat box? Yes, I see everything, yes. Okay, this chat box, you can actually start a discussion. Uh, you can either ask a question or start a discussion with other people in the, in the, in the, that are at the conference watching. Uh, you, they can say, well, uh, you know, I don't know what, you know, they can discuss, they can start like a side discussion. Uh, during the conference, uh, uh, and, and also we're trying to incorporate, I don't know if you noticed, uh, we have a message, the Facebook message, because we're finding, one of the things we found, uh, Deepak, is that, is that Facebook is so popular in countries like, uh, like you're in Europe and India and Africa, um, 
And if we can somehow incorporate the Facebook aspect, um, because I, I found if you try, it's hard to alter people's behavior. You try to you try to adapt to it, and people are comfortable it seems with Facebook, and they use it. Do do you use Facebook very much, Deepak? Yes, yes. People use Facebook hundred yeah. times a day. Yeah, the, if, if we can somehow figure out a way to incorporate Facebook into Hangout, where people can can also uh, you know also tweet questions and comments. Okay. Subod has joined us. Subod is here. Okay. Hi. Good morning. Hi, Subod. Good morning. How are you? Yeah, fine. Doing good. Can, so can you hear me? We, yes, we can. We haven't we haven't started formally yet. Uh, we have to get you all set. Uh, is your camera working okay? Yeah, everything is okay. Fine. I think I, I can't. I can't really see your camera. I don't think you have it on. Can you see me now? No, not yet. Not, not yet? yet. Not yet. Sometimes there's a conflict with. Uh, oh, there you go. There you go. Perfect. Yeah. This is Francesca. She's from Romania. And you know, yeah, hi. you know, hi, 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 hi. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, good morning. Good morning. This is being televised live at the AIDS hospital as well as uh, YouTube. Deepak, so people, I would, I would, so people in the hospital can see us right now talking. So be careful. <laughs> and, and as far as the formal, the formal, uh, the formal discussion, uh, this part will be edited out. So when it's on, when people watch it in the future, they'll watch your Deepak's discussion, and then they'll watch your can watch yours, etc. Yeah, Deepak, okay. I'm in Delhi. Deepak, I'm in Delhi now. Welcome. Welcome. Okay, uh, there's an echo. I think someone has another. Do you have any other programs open, uh, Tavod? Yeah, I have my program open. Yeah, no, no. Uh, is it? Oh, the echo's gone. Okay. Okay. Sometimes uh, when there's another. Platform open. Okay. Will I, will yeah, I we, have a, we have a few minutes. So. Cor okay. Correct. Is it, you, you have uh, ten? Five. five. In five minutes? I'm, uh, John, I'm just opening my presentation. Just see whether you can see it or not. Yeah, yeah why don't we practice because we haven't formally started. Okay. I'm just opening it for the trial, Tholi. Okay. Can you see it? Yes, excellent. excellent. Okay, thank you. 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 Okay, yeah, we have a few minutes. Deepak, I heard your talk. It was an excellent overview. Thank you. Of, uh, pediatric neurosurgery in India, actually. And uh, your contribution is great in that. Okay, not to forget. And uh, we keep on remembering our mentors for that. And uh, this initiative by you and and John is great. I think we should have more of these. And yes, uh, hopefully this will go well. Uh, I think it will. I think it will. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Everybody has Gmail. Everybody can use it. It's, you know, someone said to me, uh, Deepak. Uh, they actually called me and asked me. About uh, you know why can't we educate? Why can't we get asthmatics to use their medication? We use videos. We use uh, other means of education of, ki of children to use uh, their inhalers and how to be educated about what they're how necessary it is to be prepared. And I said, well, uh, I think videos. You know, kids like you say, the attention span five minutes. But if you can get them to interact with people. Online, yeah. I think you might have a better chance of educating children. And and the reporter said to me, "Oh, is that because you own the platform?" Uh, and I said, "No, a small company in Mountain View, California, called Google, owns this." <laughs> okay, okay. So, so, so you know, and, and this platform has hasn't been used tremendously in, in medicine. Hopefully, it will be. Uh, and there's not many areas where it has been used, but but we'll see. We'll see. Hopefully, we'll get it going in medicine. Before Subodh begins, uh, this is just to tell you, Subodh uh, yeah. and John, 
that uh, this entire program is being live streamed to, through various uh, kind of uh, platforms uh, being uh, placed in AIMS and uh, most of the medical students and uh, the delegates and the young people who can uh, watch us, they are watching us live on, through live streaming. So probably you could do the same in the Hyderabad uh, city uh, for next two days. I have circulated information about this to 2,500 members of uh, Neurological Society of India and also to Indian Society of Pediatric Neurosurgery. It is just to promote the event so that more and more people are aware about this. Great, great. Yeah, yeah. hopefully in the future uh, we can hook a lot of hospitals up to, 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 to uh, conferences like this where people can be watching at different hospitals. You know, I, you know, in the hospital, you, you know, the students, the residents are working and training. But it'd be nice if they could see, uh, you know, for example, Sabal Rahu is talking at 10 o'clock. Let, let's go to the auditorium and see him, and then I have to go do my rounds, finish seeing my patients. So, so it can, it can, uh, it can be, it can develop in that that manner too. Exactly. The archive which remains on YouTube is also very helpful for many people who cannot join us now. Mm -hmm. uh, in the city of Hyderabad also I circulated this and uh, in, especially in the pediatric hospital I, I circulated in some of the pediatric hospital I visit actually. So some of the pediatric neurologists in the city are watching this. And, uh, oh excellent, pediatric neurologist? Yes, yes, pediatric neurologist. Yeah, that's great. I, that's great. Because we love we love to hear from them. There's a tweet board on Neurosurgical TV. Uh, if you'd like to tweet a comment or question, just say hi. Just say hi. We're watching. Definitely. And the important thing is uh, we have to inc increase the awareness among these pediatricians. Besides neurosurgeons, we have to increase our awareness in the pediatricians also. So down the line, I think we should include more and more pediatricians also into this so that but primarily many of these issues are seen by pediatricians than neurosurgeons actually. So that will be a helpful method. Yes. Definitely. I think the countdown has begun, John. It is 10 o'clock. Okay, you ready? Okay, okay. Uh, ready to start? Okay, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Good, good morning. It's Dr. John Bennett broadcasting from Miami as part of the conference or the collaboration of Neurosurgical TV with uh, Deepak Gupta of the Neurosurgical Department of the AIMS Hospital in New Delhi. We have the pleasure today of having Sabu Rahu. I hope I pronounced that correctly. He's going to talk about surgical. Oh, thank you. He's going to talk about surgical options in cranial syn synostosis. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, let me introduce members of the panel first. Uh, so well, before I turn it over to you, uh, good day, Francesca. Yes. Yes. Uh, well, hold on. Hold on. Uh, I'm going to introduce the panel first of all. Okay. Yes. Uh, good morning. I'm Francesca Okia. I'm a fifth-year medical student from Bucharest, Romania, and uh, also the president of the Walter Dendi Neurosurgical Club for medical students here. And I am really honored to be part of this uh, first uh, online pediatric neurosurgery conference. I think it's a great initiative and I'm looking forward for, to the presentation. Thank you. Yes, Thank and, you. The and the doctor assembled the cast, uh, Dr. Gupta. Good morning, Dr. Gupta. Uh, good morning and uh, I look forward to your talk, uh, Dr. Subodh Raju. Yeah, I'm ready to start, John. Yes, okay, welcome. Okay, I am on with a presentation. Yes, could you please introduce yourself, who, who, where you work and what you do, etc. Uh, John, I'm Dr. Subodh Raju. I am basically a neurosurgeon passed out from AIMS, All India Institute, 15 years, 15 years into practice. And uh, uh, 40 to 50 percent of my work is related to pediatric neurosurgery. And uh, that's how I'm into uh, these issues. And uh, one minute, okay. I think I lost. And uh, I do a host of uh, pediatric neurosurgery cases, including cranial synostosis, dysraphism, and a lot of endoscopic work I do, actually. And uh, keep on doing some publications, some research in pediatric neurosurgery, because that is part of my passion. And uh, maybe down the line, I may become a pure pediatric neurosurgeon uh, down the line. 
Oh, excellent. You're talking to a future one uh, to your right, and Francesca wants to be a pediatric neurosurgeon, too. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, welcome. Okay, onward. Right. Uh, am I on? Yes, perfect. Presentation is on? Yes, it is. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning, friends. And it's a pleasant day in India today, no rains. And what I'm going to deal, first of all, I should thank John and uh, Deepak for taking this initiative. What I'm going to talk about is surgical options in cranial synostasis. Because there are two other talks lined up in cranial synostasis, I'll restrict myself to non-syndromic primary cranial synostasis. These are my affiliate hospital, Virinci Hospital and Rainbow Children's Hospital. Uh, some disclaimer and acknowledgement because in these cases I have used a lot of photographs. So I would like to say that these photographs are used only purely for academic purpose. And actually I thank my patients and attendants for helping us in advancing and disseminating. I mean they contribute a lot in disseminating uh, the medical and surgical knowledge for the future of medical science. I am thankful to them also. Coming to the introduction, because I have the first talk, I'll give a brief introduction of cranial synostosis. The term cranial synostosis refers to uh, premature fusion or multiple cranial sutures. Cranial synostosis is commonly present at birth, but is not always noticeable, especially when mild. And uh, apart from the obvious cosmetic and facial cranial deformity, early cojular sutures can cause intracranial hypertension and adversely affect the development in some patient. And if you, if you know, it is one of the major cause of a cranial dysmorphia. So normal infant skull is flexible and expansible, flexible enough to get through the vagina in a normal delivery and uh, expansible enough to accommodate the rapidly growing brain. So there are different theories which have been, uh, for, for, uh, which have been uh, proposed for the uh, formation of cranial synostasis, starting from Sommering in 1839, then Virchow and the Moss theory. I'll come a bit into it in detail actually. So Moss tells that uh, it is basically the cranial base which is uh, primarily the abnormality and the cranial vault suture abnormality develops second to the base abnormality actually. And uh, the functional matrix theory which he proposed was whenever there is a functional enlargement of the brain and that is a primary force for causing the expansion of the skull and for changing the shape and determining the final form actually in cranial synostosis. If you look at this, growth is always perpendicular to the suture. And uh, whenever there is an ossification is occurring, there is bony union occurring. That restricts the growth of this skull, actually. And early closure causes growth parallel to the suture. So instead of having a perpendicular growth, we have something called as a parallel growth. And that causes the abnormal shapes as the most commonly what we see is a societal synostosis as cephocephaly. I mean, for general purpose, explaining everyone, there's a commonest uh, cranial synostosis which we see. Excuse me, excuse me, uh, Sabu. Your slides aren't moving. I, I, you still want to be on the first slide? I'm still, and I'm moving. My slides no. are moving here. No, the slide. Okay, there you go. There you go. Okay. Okay, okay. I'll go to the. I'll I'll go out from the presentation mode. I'll put it in this only. Okay. No, you have to click on the slides. Uh, each one individually. Yeah, yeah. Now you can see it. Yes. Okay. Please check with me if you change the slide to make sure. Okay. okay. It's okay? Yes. Okay? Yes. Molecular factors? Yes. Y yes, correct. So there are a number of molecular factors which have been implicated in uh, the formation of cranial synostosis, fibroblast growth factor, TGF beta, twist, noggin, so many things have been seen. And uh, most of these factors are usually seen in syndromic cases than in non-syndromic cases actually. And there is no consistent gene abnormality associated with a specific phenotype basically. So possibly we feel it, uh, feel that the formation of a cranial synostosis is multifactorial, especially in non-syndromic cases. The physical and molecular factors along with the genetic pathways which are also responsible for this actually. Incidence is 1 in 2,500 live births. So the commonest as I told you is the sagittal synostosis. And syndromic types are less common. And there have been more than 64 syndromes have been described due to more generalized disorders of the mesenchymal development. Coming to a brief classification, we classify synostosis into primary, primary and secondary syndromic. And uh, it can be primary can be a simple when it is single suture involvement and it's compound when it is a multiple suture involvement. Then secondary, we have a host of metabolic factors. Then we have the syndromic. Dr. Dwarka later on will be covering on the syndromic synostosis. Coming to the primary, the this is the normal skull actually which you see. Then we have the metopic suture where we can't form the trigonocephaly. Then we have the brachycephaly. Uh, unilateral coronal suture, there's the anterior 
the post, uh, unilateral lambdoid suture, we call it the posterior plagiocephaly. And whenever we have a fusion of both the uh, sutures, then we form as a scaphocephaly. So what about the secondary craniosynostosis? When does it occur? It's usually in seen microcephaly, prematurity, uh, VP shunting, and positioning. Positioning is also one of the important cause of these thing of secondary craniosynostosis. Prematurity because the deformation of scaphocephaly. There's an impaired mobility and prolonged positioning of these kids, small uh, infants actually. And these usually continue to persist till uh, adulthood. And they usually don't warrant any intervention. VP shunting. Whenever there is a hydrocephalus, especially in early life in premature children, we do a shunt. That causes a secondary craniosynostosis actually. In microcephaly, surgical uh, correction is, is not indicated. We may have an abnormal OFC, but it uh, remains normal, uh, yet it is oddly shaped. Rare cases of multisucial craniosynostosis restating head growth may manifest in increased, with increased uh, intercranial pressure. These are the cases you require surgical interventions, actually. The positional deformation, as I told, is the most common cause, usually a forehead asymmetry, sometimes associated with torticollis, and usually acts as in coronal and the lambdoid sutures. And it, as I told you, it is issue, uh, seen in usually premature uh, newborns, actually. Multi-suture non-syndromic double suture, then there are the complex uh, multi-suture synostosis. There are some examples of a scaphocephaly, early fusion of the sagittal suture. Then we have the anterior plagiocephaly, the unilateral coronal synostosis, and the posterior uh, uh, plagiocephaly, a unilateral lambdoid suture. Then we have the brachycephaly, when there is a bilateral coronal suture fusion. And when we have a trigonocephaly or the conical head, we call it, there's an early fusion of the metopic sutures. Syndromic craniosynostosis, I just run through it because Dwarka is going to deal with it. Actually, 10 to 20 percent of cases, they are autosomal dominant. The commonest are the Cruzon, Sappert, Carpenter, Pfeiffer, and uh, Chosen. Some examples, these are some of my these things. Sappert, I'll, I'll not go into the details of this. Uh, it is for completion's sake, I put this in the Carpenter syndrome. Secondary, we have host of storage disorders, metabolic disorders, hematological disorders, and drug related uh, secondary craniosynostosis, actually. So how do these present, this craniosynostosis? The usual presentation when they go to a primary pediatrician is usually a cosmetic reason. And in severe cases, they can have a mental, a mental retardation. We have a raise in intracranial pressure, or they can present with visual abnormalities. So what is the mechanism to affect the development of the brain? There is global intracranial hypertension, focal brain, hypoperfusion may occur, and mechanical deformation of the uh, neuroanatomical structures can cause this mental retardation. The more common in syndromic metabolic, uh, metabolic uh, this mental retardation, and it is as I told you, it can be due to cerebral atrophy, hydrocephalus, infection, intracranial abnormalities, associated abnormalities, and if there is a family history of mental retardation. Uh, mental retardation in single suture synostosis is due to primary brain malformation, then actually due to the distortion of the skull. But there is uh, some interesting study which came out. Uh, way back in uh, in Journal of Pediatrics, it has come uh, Pediatric Physiology. It has told that a single suture craniosynostosis is a review of neurobehavioral research and theory. It has told that isolated craniosynostosis is associated with three to five fold increase in risk of cognitive defects or learning and language disability. But they could not establish a cause effect relationship on this. And but there is no particular calvaryal suture which they could associate with. So there is a very little evidence for uh, quasi-experimental studies that cranioplastic surgery prevents or reduces the risk of new neurobehavioral element. But this association was seen actually. And that is substantiated by the number of publications which we have on neurodevelopmental uh, outcome in craniosynostosis. Then next comes the visual abnormality actually. Optic atrophy, a primary optic atrophy, if there is a skull-based synostosis or early fusion which is occurring, or a secondary due to papilledema and it's more co common with uh, multi-sutural craniosynostosis. It occurs by a bony compression or because of the carotid vessels or increased ICP. And in single suture synostosis, usually the visual symptoms are much, uh, are less common, these things. Raised ICP, another feature most common in syndromic, rarely seen in single suture. And, uh, and there is a evidence that whenever you do a cranioplastic surgery, there is a decrease in ICP. Uh, detailed examination is very important, including the shape and the head circumference, everything we measure, and ear and facial abnormalities. We palpate the suture lines and frontally. If it is early, you'd, sometimes you do not do a CT scan also. A simple a high-definition ultrasound is sufficient to diagnose a case of synostosis. 
and look for it. We have to always look at the hands and feet and look for other associated anomalies. And a routine neurodevelopmental assessment is done in our place. And ophthalmology assessment is mandatory in all these patients. Whenever is required, a 3D CT head with recon and a skull X-ray is always done in these cases. So what are the issues actually in craniosynostosis? Single sutures in craniosynostosis is associated with neurobehavioral problem, including learning disabilities and behavior problem. The casual relationship between this condition is uncertain actually. A calvarial abnormality is at, le at the very least visible and easily diagnosed marker for elevated risk of neurodevelopmental problem. So the calvarial problem or the facial uh, dysmorphia or the cranial dysmorphia gives an indicator that these children have to be evaluated in detail, have to be evaluated properly by a neuropsychologist, a pediatric neuropsychologist and see for any development and anomaly. Similarly, an ophthalmology evaluation is mandatory. Next comes when do we the decision to operate. So raised ICP is seen in one third of cases, but there is no neuro impairment in this case. The most important part is the cosmetic consideration usually most important. So it, this cosmetic deformity, a child when it's small, it's, he cannot complain that I've got a, a abnormal feature, abnormal suture. It's a parent's responsibility to take care of that. So this affects a peer acceptance, parent-child bonding, and the self-image and the self-confidence of the child is also affected. The possible of future neuropsychological and educational problems and the unusual head shape can ha have profound effect on the child's personality, self-esteem and social interaction as the ch child grows up. So these things are, these in a present day scenario, cosmetic considerations also carry an equally important place as a neurodevelopmental raised ICP. Surgery, the surgery cranial vault remodeling is the typically recommended treatment. The goal of the treatment is to reduce the pressure in the head and correct the deformities of the face and skull bones. Timing of surgery. So normal growth of skull tend towards increasing roundness in the first year of life. Clinical studies say that more significant improvement if done before this first six months, in the between six months, because the first phase of the maximum brain growth occurs between three to six months. So if you can intervene before that, then it's easy. And the correction of the cranial base is more successful if, if it is done early. Advantages of early repair is remodeling is easier because the bone is very malleable and the rapid brain growth benefits the bone remodeling and there's bone defects which we create by the surgery and these things heal rapidly. So when as this graph shows the, with increasing age, what are the uh, surgical intervention we do? The initial part when we do, we do a non-restrictive bone fixation, then comes the blending techniques and as the child grows in age, we have to go in for more and more rigid uh, fixation. Surgical stenosis, I'll, I'll quote some few examples down the line about individual suture stenosis and what are the surgical strategies described in book. Most of this thing I've taken it from the pediatric neurosurgery book and the neurosurgery textbook by Yeomans actually. And then what I do also. Some of them I have included in this. So this is the most common form of stenosis. Incidence is two in thousand live births. Eighty percent are sporadic. And uh, there's a frontal compensatory, compensatory bosun. We have an elongated boat shaped head. And uh, the anterior frontal and posterior frontal are closed. And uh, the surgery, when it comes to, if it is diagnosed early, we can do an endoscopic assisted strip kinectomy, assisted procedures, followed by a helmet therapy. Or we have the whole plethora of surgical excision of the societal stuture, remodeling of the parietal bone, the occipital bone, and the frontal bone. So earlier the surgery, better is the results in these cases, actually. So endoscopic treatment, underlying principles of endoscopy. Endoscopic treatment is not basically an endoscopic treatment, it's an endoscopic assisted surgery and uh, operating on very young infants, less than three months of age. And this allows the rapid brain growth to correct the pre-surgical deformities. I'll show you some examples down the line actually. And post-operative helmets to aid and achieve correct symmetry. The use of helmets, there is a limitations in India because uh, we don't get the manufacturers to make this particular type of helmets and uh, whatever helmets which are available are highly expensive for any common man to uh, make it. So in my, at my institute, I have made some low cost helmets which uh, hardly cost uh, uh, maybe uh, uh, 10 to 20 dollars actually compared to the $700 uh, helmets which are standardly available in the international market. Coming to the, uh, some review on the outcome of endoscopic situatomy with post-operative helmet therapy in bilateral coronal stenosis has been uh, Proctor has from Boston Children's Hospital actually I had the opportunity to work with him for some time 
So I see uh, him doing a lot of this endoscopic sutureectomy, but lucky that he gets all his patients before four months of age, actually. And because it has a shorter hospital stay, early recovery, then the helmet therapy is started. Sagittal sinusitis can be safely treated with endoscopic sutureectomy and helmet therapy. An improvement in cranial volume and shape are comparable to open procedures and are enduring, actually. So what we do is a strip craniectomy, which has been traditionally described. So that has been only incorporated now. Actually, these are the, some of the cuts which we make. Sagittal, endoscopically, we can make these cuts, actually. This is a three-month-old child uh, who presented, luckily to me, with uh, uh, at three months of age. And uh, I thought that we, uh, this child is suited for a sagittal strip craniectomy. You can see the few sagittal suture here and uh, elongated boat shaped head, what we classically describe. But the thing you can see here is the frontal thing is normal here in this child. So we don't have to do a frontal limiting. So it was a pure sagittal synostosis only. So I think my, if my video plays, you can show. It's loading. So we make uh, basically two st uh, small incisions here in the front and the back, actually, and pass the endoscope. Oh, yeah, my video doesn't play now. And from the one end, we pass the endoscope. And the, from the other end, we pass the instruments. And under the guidance of the endoscope, because we are operating on the sinus, actually. So the endoscope helps us in uh, guiding us uh, through this uh, craniectomy. And we remove a strip of the bone from there. Close the suture, put a small drain, and the second day the child, first day or second day the child goes home actually. And uh, I think my video doesn't play. Okay, no problem. So this is a low cost helmet. I told you it costs around 700 rupees or something like a, um, 10 to 15, uh, 10 to 20 dollars actually. So this was the pre-operative which we had done actually, and this is the post-operative. We can see there's a correction in the shape of head. The child required a helmet pay only for at least, uh, I think, uh, next six months only. After that, it didn't require anything, actually. And the child is developmentally doing well, actually. So these are the things which, because again, referring this, uh, this children come don't come to us usually early. Because they land up in the primary pediatrician. The primary pediatrician feels there's like an abnormal shape, and, and they continue to manage that, and they usually present us late. So if you're lucky enough to get some of these children early, then we can be very helpful by doing a minimal access surgery followed it by this low cost helmet therapy and i have used it in seven eight cases they have been doing well and hope to get it uh, standardized and see if i can put it in india and some sometime down the line actually uh, this was in a review article by dr proctor actually and uh, the where he has uh, uh, emphasized the import, importance of endoscopic techniques uh, in uh, this cranial uh, so, uh, synostosis will present early and uh, the advantage, what they do is they don't do a scan, actually. They use a 3D laser scan, actually, in these type of children. So the patient is basically not exposed to any radiation, actually. So advantage of the helmet is that it allows to growth in a three-dimensional fashion and can be modified over time to achieve the specific correction in certain areas and does not require any further surgeries. Limitations of the helmet include need to wear the helmet, the need to adjust the helmet on a regular basis. Generally, to every two to four weeks intervals, they have to be adjusted. And the families generally counsel that helmet therapy might be necessary up to uh, one year of age, actually. Uh, these helmets, actually, what happens in tropical countries like India, because there is a very a lot of heat in these things, the children get irritated by this helmet. So that is, one of, that is also one of the limiting factors in uh, use of these helmets in uh, tropical countries. We have to make uh, some country-specific uh, helmets down the line. The benefits of minimal invasive surgery include much shorter surgical times, much less blood loss, and uh, a very, very small, nearly invisible incision is there, actually. And the parents are very happy. These are some other examples of helmet. Actually, this child managed to get a helmet from US uh, by doing a scan. I mean, uh, not everyone can do it, actually. So this is another case of cranial synostosis. Then comes to the ch when the child grows older, more than four months or six months uh, of age, what do we do? So a section, of skull, a section of the skull is removed as a Greek letter that's called as an anterior pi procedure or a posterior pi procedure. Uh, depending on the requirement and depending on the shape of the skull, we do it, actually. So this is, again, a case of a scaphocephaly. This child has both a sagittal and a metopic stenostosis. You can see elongated head, a frontal bossing. And this age of presentation was seven months, actually. This is a non-syndromic child. This is a CT scan of the child. You can see some of this uh, silver beaten appearance of the skull uh, because of the raised pressure. 
as i told you we do a routine ophthalmological evaluation and uh, a developmental assessment in all these children actually so this child went 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 ahead with an anterior pie procedure you can see here and uh, biparietal release front orbital uh, advancement the re remodeling of the frontal bone which is do i'll tell you subsequently how we to remodel the frontal bones to create the frontal eminences especially when the scaphocephaly the sagittal synostosis is associated with the metopic synostosis also you have to take care of the frontal bones also in those cases this is the pre op uh, man after the scalp has been uh, inverted you can see the uh, metopic is also fused actually this child has been operated in a supine position because the child didn't have any posterior problem so it's an only an anterior pie procedure what we call it actually uh these are the post op images this is you can see uh this is the pre op image of the child this is the child is growing out to be a beautiful kid nice developmentally absolutely normal and doing well so standard technique plus frontal remodeling is what uh, uh, we do advise if the child is more than 10 months old and there is severe anterior bulging so this is another child with the same uh, uh, this child didn't have a frontal problem the child only has a sagittal synostosis but presented to us late in that case what do we do sorry i missed one slide yeah uh, this is the operative photograph of this things a biparietal release of frontal this things and uh, in cases we can remove this strip of bone actually but we have to be careful in when we are removing the sagittal uh, take care of the sagittal sinuses and uh, advantage of keeping the pericranium intact uh, we cover it over that that helps in also osteogenesis the pericranium has a greater role in this but two things are there whenever you are doing a smaller procedure and you anticipate a lot of blood loss you can excise the bone along with the pericranium also so if you don't strip off the pericranium from the bone your blood loss is minimized by more than 70 ml actually but uh, pericranium has its role uh, everyone knows so it all depends on how you how experienced you are and how familiar you are while doing the craniotomy whether you want to strip off the pericranium or you want to leave the pericranium intact on that actually so that's an individual choice but this is the difference which i have seen i had done this in around 10 cases without stripping and with with stripping where i found out the blood loss to be around 70 to 75 ml less if i am not stripping off the pericranium from the bone then comes a child who is older 12 to 14 months complete cal calvary reconstruction is required in these cases and there is a severe cranial based distortion it's a more aggressive technique important thing in all these children is one is blood loss second is venous embolism this is the most important thing which has to be taken care of it has been reported to be incidence of venous embolism has been reported to be around 20 to 25% in cases of craniosynostosis surgery so the anesthetist the surgeon everyone has to be aware of this and you have to coagulate every small vein and ever, whenever there is a bleeding please stop it and a continuous irrigation and putting on moist uh, cotton patties everywhere wherever is your exposed portion and patient should not develop important most important patient should not develop hypotension due to blood loss so you the blood transfusion in these cases has to start with the skin incision only because the moment the child develops a hypotension or there is a blood loss there is a negative the uh, venous pressure venous pressure is low it sucks in air actually so that is very important has to be careful in my uh, case of around 75 cases i lost one child actually a syndromic child on table due to a venous air embolism actually so this has to be very very careful actually i should have put that into next comes the coronal synostosis it's a fair, the most uh, i mean uh, the described thing is a sagittal but what we see more and more children presented with coronal synostosis that's a unilateral coronal synostosis called as a plegocephaly uh, most cases are sporadic and uh, unilateral coronal synostosis occur with synostosis of the uh, frontospinoidal or frontoethmoidal uh, bone manifest as a progressive cranial orbital and facial asymmetry and we get something called as a facial scoliosis this is a unilateral coronal synostosis a ct scan of the patient the coronal one unilateral one side coronal suture is fused here 
The fused suture, flattening of the ipsilateral frontal bone, bulging of the ipsilateral squamous temporary and contralateral frontal bone, and the ipsilateral ear is fused to the suture displaced and it's displaced anteriorly. The important thing is to make aware the neurosurgeons, pediatric neurosurgeons and the pediatrician that how to differentiate between a deformational versus a plagiocephaly actually. In infants with position head deformity, the ear migrates anteriorly and the forehead protrudes on the side of the occipital flattening. So I'll go to the difference actually. This is a very important slide actually for, I mean, I keep on telling to my uh, colleagues and the pediatrician how to uh, differentiate this because many times a unilateral craniosynostosis is left as a deformation and nothing, no intervention is done actually. So these, some of the differences which are standardly available in every uh, textbook if you see. Yes. Uh, what we do is bicoronal flap, a bifrontal craniotomy, a orbital roof. Hello? A lot of disturbance. Bicoronal flap, bifrontal craniotomy, orbital roof osteotomy extending to the frontozygomatic suture laterally to the midline. And ipsilateral superior orbitarium is contoured to by drilling to equalize the mediolateral dimension of the orbit actually. So this is the thing which you do actually. Once you do a front orbital, these things, the V-shaped on uh, this thing is corrected to match the opposite side. This is a small example. This child presented quite late, 16 months of age, non-syndromic developmental milestones were normal. But later on, we find out that this child has a speech delay. This child has a left-sided plagiocephaly. And I covered the eyes, but if you see, this is, this is called as a facial scoliosis. This bend of the nose and this thing from the forehead, this is called as a facial scoliosis. And they have a tilt. So whenever the child has a tilt, the skull base has to be evaluated properly. This tilt can be because of two reasons. Either there is a condylar hypoplasia, of unilateral condylar hypoplasia, or because of this pericocephaly, they developed a small squint and by compensation, the constantly the by compensation to make the visual uh, feel normal, they usually tilt the head. So it's an anatomical problem or a functional problem that has to be seen, always evaluated pre-surgically because, uh, and sometimes these persist after surgery also. So if there is no anatomical abnormality in the condyles and anything, you have to just gently relax the sternocleidal mustard and ask to do some physiotherapy. Sometimes a passive orthosis is also required to make this correction uh, head. This is a CT scan of a child, the same child. You can see a unilateral uh, coronal synostosis, the plagiocephaly. The brain looks quite tight here. The CSS spaces are obliterated in this, cases, this case. Uh, this is the case where we do a bifrontal orbital craniotomy, left frontal orbital advancement, and contouring of the frontal bones. The frontal bone is contoured by putting multiple radial incisions so as to create a new frontal eminence for the child. Uh, this is the preoperative, this is the six months post-op, and this is the 12 months post-op. A small tilt still remains in this child, but uh, it's fine. Cosmetically, she is good and she is going, she is known almost eight years old, eight or nine years old. She's going out to be a beautiful girl. These are some other cases where I was talking of the frontal bone remodeling, which I uh, observed. You put uh, multiple radial incisions on that. Uh, this is showing us text. Yeah, this is another child, left anterior plagiocephaly. You can see this. This is a this is a pre-op picture. This is a post-op picture of the child. This is another, uh, there are two techniques of doing this, left and uh, anterior pregocephaly. Uh, one is the thing which I described where you do a frontal orbital, inlateral frontal orbital advancement. And usually we do tend to overcorrect slightly in these patients because there is some settling down. So uh, 20 to 30 percent overcorrection is always mandated in, in this pregocephaly. This is a second uh, type of thing which we do. That is called as, we rotate the frontal bone actually, keeping this in intact. I think if you can go to the presentation view, I can show you, but that's not playing. So here is a frontal bone. The midline has been rotated slightly. The excess bone in cut is one side and put on the other side. After this rotation is done, then what we do is we remodel the frontal bone by giving multiple radial incisions and plicating the frontal bone by uh, 28 gauze stainless steel wire. 
so as to create good frontal eminences on that side actually. So these are the two techniques which are standardly described for uh, managing this plagiocephalis. One is a rotation of the flap, another is a remodeling of the bone by just doing a frontal orbital advancement. The next comes the endoscopic technique. Again, at a less than three month old child, you can do a simple suturectomy in these cases. And this is the lesser wing of sponoid, temporal dura, the frontal dura. Again, if you are lucky to get a, a child which is less than three months of age. Next comes the bilateral, bilateral coronal synostosis or the brachycephaly. Uh, fused coronal suture, they have a shortened anterocranial fossa. Osteotomies, which we do usually, is a bifrontal or craniotomy, biparietal craniotomy, and uh, bilateral supraorbital rim advancement, if I see. One minute, it's not playing. These type of uh, things, again, uh, as I told you, the blood loss and everything has to be careful. My this thing presentation has got stuck. Yeah, this is a scan of the child. You can see a flattened head. The bilateral, both the coronal sutures are fused, and this child is a typical, typical silver beaten appearance of the skull. The flat anterior, a tight skull. We do a frontal orbital advancement in these cases. As a front, frontal orbit, uh, eminences are normal in these cases, so you don't have to remodel the frontal bone. You have to just do a frontal orbital advancement and do a piparietal release and just leave it like that. If required, if the posterior part is not is also flattened, you need to correct. But in this child, if you see, the posterior part is not that abnormal. So we didn't do anything in the posterior part. We just corrected the anterior part. It's a frontal orbital advancement we did only these cases, actually. Next, coming to the metopic synostosis, is the first cranial suture to fuse at seven to eight months of age. Premature closure results in the typical trigonocephaly, male preponderance, and uh, Prominent metopoic ridge, this is a commonest complaint with this children come. And some children may have a, a hypotelorism. So this is the basic uh, sketch diagram uh, depicting what is the problem. Uh, isolated etiology is unknown. It can be part of uh, uh, many syndromes. If child presents early to you, you can do an uh, endoscopic surgery, endoscopic assisted strip craniectomy, or you can do an open surgery. Uh, bifrontal craniotomy, frontal bone remodeling, very important in these cases of trigonocephaly because they have a flat frontal bone. Whenever the frontal bone is flat, only advancement doesn't suffice. You have to remodel to create a frontal eminence in these children actually. And in older, older than three years here, you have to do, as I told you before, in scaphocephaly, you have to do an extensive remodeling of this frontal bone actually because the bone becomes more and more rigid. There's a pre-op uh, images of the child, uh, triangular head, conical head. Uh, this is the frontal bone which has been straightened by this method you can see. It's a triangular bone. We do an osteotomy here, put a piece of bone graft, and in some cases I use bioabsorbable plates or we use a small titanium. The rigid fixation is usually required in the base of the skull only. The other parts of the skull can be managed by simple sutures. But I feel that the base of the skull uh, rigid fixation is always helpful so that uh, it acts as a scaffold to other bones to settle and the shape comes good actually. But the problem in India is again the, the bioabsorbable plates which are available are quite expensive actually. And uh, we can use it, it as, uh, we use it limitedly and sparingly actually, uh, the bioabsorbable plates. So what to optimize that, what I do is that I only use this absorbable bioabsorbable plates on the base only. I don't try to use those plates above. So to bring in the bring down the cost, and then if it is not available, we use this small titanium mini plates actually, or I put a bone graft and just put by uh, 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 ethylon sutures. This is the thing which I was explaining about frontal bone remodeling. Take the frontal bone, we make multiple radial cuts into that. Okay, once you make this radial cuts, take a fine stainless steel wire and plicate that. So if you do a circumferential plica plication of this this frontal eminence is created. So after surgery, it gives a very good cosmetic result actually. If you add on to all your 
plagiocaphaly and the trigonocaphaly. It gives a very good feature. So this radial cuts are useful in both uh, both uh, circumstances. Whenever you want to plicate it and form a frontal eminence, or whenever you want to flatten the bone also, these multiple radial cuts are also very useful. So they can be uh, used in either ways depending on the requirement actually. So this is the child post-op. You can see the good frontal eminences which has come up. Uh, this is the pre-op image. This is a post-op image actually. And this is uh, early post-op image. This is a late, late post-op image. Good frontal eminences come up actually. So this is things if you keep on doing it, you will know where and when it's required. This is another child. Same with the trigonocaphaly. You can see the conical head here and this child in the post-op period. Uh, endoscopic, as I told you, if indicated, if you get a proper child and these things and you have can have a helmet uh, given to the child. These children don't require helmet for a long time. Uh, three to four months of helmet therapy is sufficient for these children, actually. Next comes the lambdoid synostosis, extremely uncommon, and it's the least common, actually. And distinction is important, again, to deformation and uh, uh, to synostosis. And uh, most common cause, usually forehead asymmetry, sometimes associated with torticollis. And, uh, 40% of these things are seen in newborn, actually. This is, again, a differential, di uh, differential the diagnosis of posterior plagiocaphaly, how to differentiate it, actually. The, uh, this is an occipital. This is basically a parietal, this thing. Frontal passing, ipsilateral, contralateral. The more important thing, when you take the head shape, when you look at a uh, superior view, when you take a vertex view, this is a, a deformation is basically a parallelogram. But this is a trapezium. When you took a posterior view, it's normal, but this one is a parallelogram. Again, uh, a deformation is uh, incidence is common, more common than the true uh, lambdoid synostosis, actually. Uh, in deformation, the occipital flattening is there, and uh, suture is open, and frontoparietal brossing is there ipsilaterally in deformation, actually. So this is what I was trying to tell. In deformation, it's usually a parallelogram. Whereas in the, this is a trapezoid, actually, in case of a true uh, uh, lambdoid synostosis. Uh, elevation of the skull vertex is important. And here what we do is a biparietal uh, occipital bone flaps, bifrontal symmetry, if required, and the bone is recontoured. But it's seldom required. This is a case of a posterior brachycephaly, actually. It's not a unilateral, it's a bilateral. This child had a raised ICP with florid papilledema, actually. And we saw this uh, child, if you can see, you can appreciate the CT scan. Both the lambdoid sutures and these things are fused, actually. So this, we operate these children in the prone position. This is another child, interesting child, with the sagittal coronal lambdoid synostosis, uh, pancranial synostosis, actually. So what surgery did we do in this children was a corrective cranioplasty that's endoscopic we did. This child presented early to us. Just did a sagittal strip tenectomy with biparietal release, coronal release, and bilambroid. Uh, so when you do an endoscopic surgery, you can do some dissection also and release it. The only important thing is, I am important thing is, you should see that the blood loss has uh, it's it's not too much adherent. And what happens is the dura comes and protrudes into these bony defects because you see the severe silver bitten and copper bitten appearance of this. So the chances of injuring the dura in severe these cases are high if you do try to do an endoscopic surgery. So and if you do a blind surgery, so endoscopic, a 30 degree or 70 degree endoscope is very, very helpful in these cases if you're trying to do an endoscopic strip connectomy in these cases, actually. This child had a CT scan because of a head injury later on after uh, some days, actually. So if you can see, the, all the silver bitten and copper bitten appearance of this skull has disappeared, actually. This is around uh, eight months after the primary surgery. So this child is doing well, actually. This media is not playing. I don't know why videos are not playing. There's another child with a pancranial synostosis. Uh, extremely, actually, uh, this was a non, it looks like a syndromic, but this was a non syndromic child. Uh, this required a two stage surgery because the bone was very brittle. The child developed pseudo meningocele at one side because of a CSF leak. The child required two surgery, but she has turned out beautiful, actually, down the line. Uh, this is another case of a tarikephaly. This child had an optic nerve atrophy and an ACM type 1 with syringomyelia. So surgery, what we do is a corrective cranioplasty with bifrontal coronal lambdoid and parietal release. 
a sagittal striptinectomy with a frontoorbital advancement. And during that surgery, in these cases where there is a primary optic nerve compression because of bony distings, we tend to do a optic nerve decompression also in these cases actually. Because once you do a frontoorbital advancement and you remove that uh, bone, just reflecting in the dura, uh, doing an optic nerve de decompression is not a very difficult job actually. Coming to uh, craniofacial syndromes, I think Suhas and other people are going to cover it later on down the line. So coming to complications, mortality in craniofacial surgery are fortunately very low. And the most important thing is a post-operative hypothermia. And due to most, more extensive tissue dissection and requirement of transfusion, Infection is the another things, and uh, these all things depends on the age of this uh, child, the type of surgery you are doing, how extensive is the surgery, and they usually require, uh, uh, as I told you, two things when we counsel the children is uh, when the parents is one is blood loss and second is infection. And the dural tears, if you have, you have to repair it very meticulously. If required, put a patch and glue it, because if they continue to have a pseudo meningocele, if they develop a pseudo meningocele that repairing is another big surgery. So this has to be very careful. If you have an accidental dural tear, it has to be repaired primarily with a patch and glue also, so that they don't have a CSF leak. Ocular morbidity, pre and post-op impairment seen with unilateral coronal synostosis and metopic synostosis because once we are correction this uh, anterior plagiocephaly, in the early period, post-op period, the, these children tend to create a diplopy actually. I mean, they'll not complain of diplopy actually, but uh, they'll be restless whenever they uh, see. So these things have to be evaluated by a pediatric ophthalmologist and they take care, but that usually compensates in another maybe one month to one and a half months. They, uh, so the pediatric ophthalmologist also is closely involved in our work. And the uh, oculoplasty departments uh, sometimes join us uh, in these type of uh, cases whenever there is a base of this thing because they also give some important inputs in management of these cases. Coming to long-term follow-up, speech, genetic counseling, feeding, swallowing is required. And as I told you, refusion may require redo surgeries. These things also we counsel the parents when you do a primary surgery, that the child may require a resurgery if required. So my first conclusion or summarizing is the key to creating craniosynosis early detection and treatment. That is increasing the awareness among the primary care physician, that is a pediatrician. At the base level, we have to create an awareness among them actually first. Some forms of craniosynostosis can affect the brain and development of child. The degree of problems is dependent on the severity of the synostosis, the number of sutures that are fused, and the presence of brain or other organ system involvement. Genetic counseling may be recommended by the physician to evaluate the parents of child for any heredity disorders that may tend to run in families. And a child with craniosynostosis requires frequent medical evaluation to ensure that the skull, facial bones, and brain are developing normally. They have to be in the regular follow-up. The medical team works with the child's family to provide education, guidance to improve the health and well-being of the child. And uh, craniosynostosis surgery is basically an art. You have to imagine in the 3D space whenever you are going to operate on these things and then only you can deliver a very good surgery. And ending, thank you to my all my little angels who helped me and uh, who have been uh, operated with me. I must have done around 70 odd surgeries actually of synostosis of different types. And luckily, none of them have required a redo surgery till date. Again, thank you. Uh, with this, I conclude my talk. John? Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Raju, for a great presentation. Great illustrations. Um, I just have, uh, well, Alex, uh, Francesca and uh, Deepak, do you have any questions or comments for uh, the doctor? Yeah. Uh, uh, so congratulations, uh, Subodh, for a wonderful uh, cover-up on this uh, topic of uh, non-syndromic craniosynostosis. I would Thank like you, to David. know. I would like to know in what percentage of cases of non-syndromic variants uh, do you do uh, genetic workup, and uh, how do you counsel the patient's family for the next birth in non-syndromic variants? Thank you. Uh, most of this non-syndromic uh, synostosis, a complete evaluation is done. First, uh, we don't do a gene analysis on everything. Uh, we, ha we have a genetist, uh, genetic, uh, medical genetics uh, uh, associated with me 
she does a thorough uh, morphological and evaluation everything if there is no abnormality as such seen we don't go for a gene analysis in these things and uh, so no specific genetic counseling is required in those cases and uh, most of the children the subsequent sibling or the preceding uh, previous sibling never had a problem in this non syndromic cases actually i never had a familial uh, uh, familiar trait which is running wherein one sibling is affected and the second sibling is affected yes but one important thing i have seen is the family when it comes to the father to the kid it's mostly a shape of the head it is not a synostosis so many times such abnormal shape of the head is considered as a synostosis which is actually not actually and uh, what are the second part of your question uh, what do you tell the patient's family because the common question asked by the parents is uh, what is the risk of my second child being affected uh, with the same problem i mean uh, i tell them it's just uh, uh, the incidence is same as occurrence of a craniosynostosis uh, uh, the, the incidence of craniosynostosis there is one in 2500 live births that's all uh, my second question is uh, regarding the need of uh, fronto orbital advancements uh, what is your thought in uh, doing this when the child is relatively young let us say you have a child who is 7 or 8 months of age uh, with some uh, hypertelorism or with some uh, frontal bossing and some shallow orbits uh, mm. do you go ahead with those frontal orbital advancement at this that age or do you wait for the child to grow older and then uh, operate what are your thoughts on that for me a craniosynostosis surgery is best done as early as possible under if you have a safe anesthesia safe setup everything is done the best time is to operate as early as possible because as i told you molding of the bones the fusion of the bones healing of the bones is excellent in the smaller the child the small children if you remove all other risks as i'm telling you the risks of blood loss and these things have to be taken care otherwise you operate it as early as possible thank you thank you and prashastra you have a question uh, no uh, no i don't have a question i would only i like to congratulate you doctor for your wonderful practice and this incredible presentation uh, thank you so much it, it thank you thank you it has been a great honor and a pleasure thank you very thank much you very much. yeah i have a quick question um how do most of these patients get to you are they referred from their local pediatricians i imagine it, it takes a while for some to be referred correct uh these patients usually i do a lot of uh, as i told you i am associated with a pediatric hospital okay it's a it, it's a one of the primary in this state it is a one of the main referral centers in the uh, state so and i go and conduct talks awareness talks in pediatric conferences also i don't okay. restrict i don't restrict my talks to neurosurgical fraternity or neurology fraternity uh, there is a another craniosynostosis talk which i have which is just a general talk to increase the awareness among the pediatrician also mm-hmm. so a small uh, whenever they have the small meets the pediatric conferences or meets these things i give a small talk on ever increasing the awareness in uh, the primary pediatrician so over time what has happened initially when i started this surgery maybe t- 11 years back i used to operate maybe one case every two months or so but now what is has state is i get at least three or four referrals every month actually mm-hmm. so that is helpful and i at least i am hopeful for the future that uh, if the awareness is increased we can get uh, to tell and propagate this early detection and uh, uh, surgery is helpful yeah as i mentioned in our previous talk this platform is a great way for neuro pediatric neurosurgeons to meet with pediatricians online uh, and have conferences and and uh, be able to spread the word and and, and actually get to these patients quickly because yes. in medicine like anything the quicker you get to the patient the better so okay okay very good uh, i'd like to thank you doc for a great presentation for taking the time and the, your dedication in your career and we thank you very much we welcome you to participate in as many of these conferences as you want this weekend so I'll wrap this conference up and thank you all members of the panel thank you thank you thank you very much i'm signing off yes okay okay that ends this uh, presentation we're going to edit it so that each presentation is separate yes and, yes uh, it is i i good morning
Hi, hi. You recognize Ike, right? Who does not recognize Ike? Well, you know, <laughs> be, be careful. You don't want to go to Ike Farm. He, he makes you work. Ike. <laughs> Ike. Hey, Ike, you're muted. We're, 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 uh, we're kind of in between shows. Ike, Ike is, uh, did you want to check your video to make sure it worked? Ike? Can you hear me okay, Ike? Yeah, you're, you're on mute, Ike. You're on mute. You're on mute. You're, you're on mute, Ike. Mute. Can't hear. Can't hear. Can you hear me? Yeah, I, there you go. There you go. Morning, guys. <laughs> Hi, Ike. Hey, Subod. Good talk. Great talk, Subod. Thanks. Thanks, Ike. As usual, look very handsome, fresh. <laughs> uh, he's a dashing neurosurgeon. There you go. You wouldn't need to do a craniosynostosis surgery on me, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> Very impressive. You want to Very check your video light to make sure it works? Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, I wanted to present. Uh, uh, first on uh, 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 some aspects of pediatric neurosurgery because I got only really two days for presenting on this. So, I mean, my talk is not going to be as impressive as Deepak's or Subo's, uh, but I'll try my best. And, and I'll also uh, try to put in a 10-minute documentary into uh, the talk. Okay. So, um, you're pretty, you yeah. going to screen share or are you going to run it separately and, and screen share the video? I would uh, start off straight, and then once we have, if we have time, then we screen the video. Otherwise, oh, okay. uh, you're going to talk uh, pediatric brain trauma, correct? Yeah, yeah, pediatric. Yeah, okay. Yeah, we got a few minutes, uh, and this is all between shows. We'll edit this out. But you know, I this is live in the hospital, so be careful what you say. It's it's live in the Ames Hospital. <laughs> uh, do you, do you need me to sign off and sign in again, John? No, 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 because because we're just going to run this together. Uh, although it will make it easier for Simon to uh, edit yeah. uh, if we uh, sign off and send you another link. Sure, sure. Uh, so, maybe maybe uh, the maybe we'll do that to make it easier for Simon. So I'm going to sign off with Deepak and Francesca and and uh, Doctor. Dr. Uh, Rahu, I'm going to send you a link, okay, to come Thank back you. in. Another link to come back in, okay? Thank you. Okay, signing off.